is live from the Sky News City Studio. Could interest rates have peaked? The Governor of the Bank of England tells MPs further hikes may be unnecessary. I think inflation is, you know, is coming down and our sort of short-term forecast is, is performing better. Food price inflation is beginning to ease, according to the chief executive of the company that owns Wagamama. Plus, stuck in first gear, the British Chambers of Commerce predicts a sluggish few years ahead for the British economy. I've been speaking to the Director General. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. The Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, has this afternoon held out some hope for homeowners reeling from 14 consecutive interest rate rises over the last 18 months. Mr Bailey told MPs on the Treasury Select Committee he was confident that inflation would continue to fall and that the UK was no longer in a place where it was clear interest rates needed to rise further. But he warned it was possible the recent rise in the oil price could lead to an upward blip in the next set of inflation figures. We haven't had the degree of shocks in the last year that we obviously had when you know, following the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so in that sense, I think inflation is, you know, is coming down and our sort of short-term forecast is, is performing better. I think it is, I should say, possibly that we will get a tick up in the next release because fuel prices down in August last year and have went up a bit in August this year. But I don't see that as essentially changing the, the path. Well, joining me now is Simon French, Managing Director and Chief Economist and Head of Research at the Investment Bank, Pamela Gordon. Simon, good to see you. I mean, Andrew Bailey clearly thinks we're near the top of the rate tightening cycle, yep. but maybe not there yet. No, I mean, this is consistent with what he said in the aftermath of the August Monetary Policy Report, that there are potentially two paths. There's a path that the market believes at the moment, that is, that rates go maybe one, two more hikes from here, but then start to come down at the back end of 2024 and beyond. Or... He was laying out uh, another path, which is they're held where they are, but for quite a protracted period of time. And his argument was it makes largely the same impact on cooling inflationary pressure in the economy. So he's pretty agnostic and wants to be driven by the data. I'm not entirely sure the headline is new news versus what we learned at the start of August, but certainly when Andrew Bailey says it, there is a sense that the market might be mispricing how likely 25 bips in the middle of uh, September is. Yeah, very, very interesting. And his comments, it's worth noting, did move the pound and the gilt uh, market this afternoon. Yeah, it did. And th that's partly because... There was quite conflicting data since that August uh, statement from the Bank of England. We had quite strong core wage growth, but actually the one-month print for payroll employment in July was really soft. And actually, we heard the clip from Andrew Bailey, but there's also John Cunliffe, his deputy, talking about really conflicting data signals. That's what financial markets don't like, because, of course, they're trying to have it as a, a slam dunk, whether it be a hold or whether a hike. The Federal Reserve in the US, they've... They've concluded there's going to be a hold. The ECB, they're not quite sure. It's 60-30. The Bank of England, 80-20 at the moment in terms of markets. That's really not where the pricing is uh, supposed to be. I'd argue Andrew Bailey hasn't managed the communications particularly well in this regard. Right. Well, I mean, cool. I mean, in fairness to him, the, the picture has been muddied, of course, by this rise in the oil price over the last few weeks. It has, um, but actually more material when you plug it into their forecasting models, which, of course, come in for a lot of criticism in this hearing and previously. The gas price is more important. Actually, the gas price has been going in the opposite direction. So 135p a therm moving down to about 120p a therm on the forward view. That's still a situation where households will be paying... The average household, has to be said, will be paying less than £2,000 going into the winter. So, yes, they'll be paying more for their petrol, but their overall cost of energy, there's not a material move. You mentioned John Cunliffe there. I mean, there was a lot of talk in this hearing about uh, inflation expectations. I mean, yes. that is clearly something that the bank are watching very, very closely. And also, it doesn't seem yet obvious whether that is starting to affect the way that workers are approaching wage negotiations. Well, I thought John Cunliffe made a good point. I thought his was by far the more, most impressive testimony of the witnesses that was put out there. He said, look, the idea that core inflation, services inflation, wage inflation and headline inflation are separate entities is wrong. People take their cues, they set their prices based on what they see in terms of headline inflation. So his argument was core inflation, wage settlements, at least nominally in price terms, will come down as headline inflation comes down. There's quite a lot of visibility that the, the pure base effects from 
the very high prices last year as they roll out in the next few months will bring headline inflation down to 4 or 5% and therefore bring wages down from 8 7 to closer to 4 or 5. Yeah, but that could be a lagging effect, couldn't it? I mean, uh, it will be. Th 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 those wage uh, cha those expectations won't change very rapidly, will they? No, they won't. Um, and look, in terms of setting policy, which all central banks have to do on a sort of 18-month, two-year view, understanding how expectations will feed into the wage-setting process and therefore generate sustained inflation, because the volatility of, of food, of oil, of gas is well understood, those expectations, I'd say the survey-based data and the market-based data based on guilt pricing does suggest that they're coming back. It's whether, and there was a bit of conflicting views between the uh, the people questioning, so the MPs questioning and the, the Bank of England, whether that was going to follow a straight line downwards or whether it was going to stabilise at a much higher level, which makes it harder for the bank sustainably to hit 2%. Well, look, Simon, while we've got you, we have this extraordinary uh, upgrade in the uh, GDP data from yes. the Office for National Statistics last Friday. Mm. How much of a bearing does that have on current policy making? Um, not a lot, either in terms of monetary policy or fiscal policy, so in terms of setting interest rates, setting tax and spending. I think what it really matters, actually, is the perception for inward investment and the degree that that feeds into the thinking of the government and the Bank of England or what the right setting of policy is. Because a lot of international investors, who, of course, have a huge stake in the UK, given the big trade deficit and fiscal deficit that we run, have looked at the fact that the UK had, until last Friday, seemingly underperformed the rest of the G7, seemingly not returned to pre-pandemic levels, but that narrative is no longer accurate. Do they reappraise it and be more favourable towards the UK, bidding up the value of assets? I think that's probably the most tangible economic impact rather than fiscal or monetary policy. Yeah, a lot of investors will hope you're right there. Simon, yes. always good to see you. Thank you. Some other news stories for you now. And Nat West Group has confirmed that the city grandee Rick Haythornthwaite will succeed Sir Howard Davis as its chairman. Mr Haythornthwaite, whose appointment was first reported by Sky's Mark Kleinman, has previously chaired Mastercard, Centrica and Network Rail and is currently chair of Ocado and the AA. Well, Mark Seligman, Nat West's senior independent director, said Rick is a highly experienced chair who combines a successful commercial career with a deep knowledge of financial services, markets and technology, as well as a strong record of delivery at significant customer-facing organisations. House building in the UK fell last month at the second fastest pace since the first Covid lockdown, according to a survey published today. The Purchasing Managers Index survey for construction, in which anything above 50 represents growth and anything below that a contraction, came in at 50.8 for August. That was down from 51.7 in July. But S&P Global, which produces the figures, said the reading for house building came in at 40.7, and that was the second worst number since May 2020. Well, separately today, Barrett Developments predicted it will build fewer new homes this year for the second year running, as it reported a 16% drop in pre-tax profits to £884.3 million for the year to the end of June. The chief executive of the company that owns Wagamama has told Sky News he's starting to see food price inflation starting to ease. Andy Hornby was speaking as the restaurant group, which also owns Frankie and Benny's and the pub operator Brunning and Price, reported underlying earnings of £36.3 million for the 23 weeks to the 2nd of July. That was up 15% on the same period last year. This year, 2023, we expect food inflation to end up somewhere between 10 and 11%. Whereas next year, 2024, we're forecasting food price inflation of more like 4 to 5%. So we are seeing a real moderation going forwards. But nevertheless, people do need to bear in mind that's a moderation on top of very strong inflation over the last 9, 10 months. A bit more detail for you now on the breaking news this afternoon on the escaped terror suspect. We've just had a statement from the Metropolitan Police. A spokesperson has told Sky News that an alert was issued by the Counter-Terrorism Command earlier today in relation to Daniel Khalif. It was through established operational briefing channels to relevant UK police and law enforcement agencies, including those at UK ports and borders. We will have more on this developing story when we get it. Now, the UK's fragile economy remains stuck in first gear, according to the British Chambers of Commerce. In its latest quarterly economic forecast, it's marginally upgraded its GDP forecast for 2023 to 0.4%, but it predicts that economic activity will remain very weak throughout 2024 and 2025. I've been speaking with the BCC's Director-General, Siobhan Haviland. 
we're seeing effectively flat growth for this year and and into next year and, and, and a third year, uh, as well as inflation, you know, playing out for a little bit longer, probably getting to where the government wants it by the end of the year, but still an issue after that. <sighs> What's playing that out? Well, in, inflation and the interest rates that have obviously been brought in to try and curb that have effectively really dampened household spending and business investment. People are holding on to their money, and that is really what is driving that lower growth, along with, of course, government spending being cut back and challenges, con continuous challenging for our exports. And you're expecting 0.3% next year and 0.7% in 2025. So these conditions really you think are going to prevail for some time to come? Yep, three years effectively at what is less than 1% growth, so pretty much flat. Are you building any assumptions about a possible change of government into this? Because, I mean, we could have one by 2025. We could, and the policies that we have been talking about that we want to work on, obviously we want to work on with politicians of all stripes. Because the thing is here, it's about business and government politicians working together to improve the economy. We all want the same thing, don't we? Government does, politicians do, business does. So that's the idea, a partnership together to try and fix our issues. You don't seem to think inflation is going to come down particularly rapidly. Well, inflation's going to come down, we're forecasting, to the 5% the government are looking for by the end of this year, but it's going to take at least another 18 months to get down to the target of 2%. But looking at your assessment, I mean, it's, you've just talked about interest rates. It isn't just interest rates and inflation that's behind this assessment, is it? It's a, it's a whole cocktail of, of factors, really. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of four things we're calling for at the moment, so we've published a manifesto in terms of the run-up to party conferences, uh, not long now, and there are four big things. And, you know, we recognise that money's tight. So these are about practical, pragmatic things we can put in place quickly. Four things. The planning system. We need a faster, simpler planning system, both for business, but, of course, housing and businesses. We need to look at the uh, post-Windsor framework. We need to look at our relationship with the EU, improve, you know, imports and exports. Uh, apprenticeship levy, you know, a great thing, but we need a lot more flexibility for businesses to, you know, improve, train their current workforce, as well as bringing new people in. And the fourth one is the grid. So, as you know, I travel the country meeting businesses on an ongoing basis. And honestly, in the last six months, everybody brings up the grid. So as an infrastructure, a grid infrastructure that's fit for our future w when we need to get to net zero. Just to pick up on one of those that you mentioned there, the planning system. I mean, yeah. A lot of planning decisions and consents are delivered by local government. Birmingham City Council has effectively just declared itself bankrupt and we're told that there are other local authorities on the way. How much of an obstacle is that going to be to efficient planning decisions? It's a huge challenge. In fact, it's one of the major challenges. Local government, local areas just don't have enough resource. They don't have enough resource, they don't have enough people, they don't have enough planners, and that is massively sticking up the system. You know, we need, uh, to take a step back, a better overall sort of bit of spatial planning, not just for housing and businesses, but obviously infrastructure that goes with it, but then everything gets stuck in the system. We need a really well-functioning public rail for business to be able to invest. And to the point that you made on the grid there, are you saying that National Grid has not been investing enough? National Grid have said that they haven't invested enough for where we are going. And, you know, getting to net zero, I think, is coming up quicker than people plan for. So a grid, an infrastructure that allows businesses to get to net zero, not just, you know, they're making changes, they're making changes very quickly, but the queuing system so that the right projects are being fast-tracked is really important. And that infrastructure build, the grid infrastructure build, which I know the grid are looking to do, that's great for local economic growth too, of course, because supply chains, producers jobs, real multiplier effect. We've got an autumn statement coming up on the 22nd of November. Are you expecting any fireworks then? So, you know, we're trying to work... We're working closely with the Treasury to help think about within the Chancellor's tight fiscal envelope, what we can do. Um, business's number one issue, it's still the workforce. It's, it's getting people. And so we know that the, ch the Chancellor's thinking about that, you know, currently thinking about how we reach further out into the workforce to bring people in. I think that's going to be the really important area. And just one uh, final thought on uh, your GDP forecast. Were, were these made before 
the ONS came up with these big upgrades last Friday? Uh, they, they were, they were, but those upgrades, of course, are historic. They don't really, they're not really going to affect future growth. We know the p position that we're in now. They are very important, though, aren't they, those upgrades? Because, I mean, had the Bank of England known about some of this, they might have raised interest rates more early than they did or wound back on QE more early than they did. It does have an impact. Yeah, uh, they, they might have done, I mean, interest rates and the interest rate rises uh, have been very hard for business. You know, I think a lot of businesses st still holding loans from COVID. So this is another reason, another reason for them to hold on to their cash and not invest. And that's a challenge for the economy and we need to get past that. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have finished up this Wednesday afternoon. Don't go away. Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, is back-breaking work. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? So. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. I just took a shower above the clouds. You know why? Because this is the Emirates A380.
Fly Emirates fly better. Welcome back. A bit more detail on the escaped terror suspects on which we've been reporting this afternoon. A Whitehall source has told Sky News the suspect is alleged to have escaped from Wandsworth Prison under a food truck using straps and holding on to the bottom. A bit more on his army career. Daniel Khalif, who's 21 years old, was in the Royal Signals and had the rank of signaller, which is equivalent to a private. Well, European equities have fallen for a sixth consecutive session after European Central Bank survey pointed to a rise in inflation expectations among consumers, potentially pointing to another interest rate rise in the Eurozone. All the main indices finished in negative territory. Talking points today include Telefonica, the Spanish telecoms operator, finished half of 1% higher. That's on news that Saudi Arabia's STC has declared a 9.9% stake, which makes it the company's biggest shareholder. Here in London, the FTSE 100 also finished in negative ter uh, territory, a sixth of 1% lower. Miners and drug majors were weighing on the index. The leading blue chip gainers were Johnson, Maffey, and BM, both of which had sold off earlier in the week, while Burberry is the leading FTSE faller this afternoon. That's in line with luxury goods retailers elsewhere. Outside the FTSE, a lot of news uh, flow there. The uh, private equity firm Bridgepoint finished up 10% nearly after its acquisition of the US infrastructure investor ECP was well received, while the ready meal manufacturer Bacavor and the asset manager Ashmore both rose on their their results. On the downside, WH Smith has finished off nearly 6.5% down after trading update disappointed. Wall Street's open to the downside ahead of an update on the US economy from the Federal Reserve later today. Apple shares weighing on the index and off nearly 3% and that's on reports that China has banned government officials from using its devices for work. On the foreign exchange markets, well, I mentioned uh, Andrew Bailey's comments earlier on, and those uh, certainly weighed on the pound, which has finished off half of 1% uh, lower against both the US dollar and the euro. And as regular viewers will know, the oil price hit $90 a barrel yesterday for the first time since the 18th of November last year. It slipped a little this morning. It's clawed back nearly all of those gains. A barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $90.03 a barrel. Joining me now is Axel Rudolph, the senior market analyst at IG. Axel, good to see you this, uh, this afternoon. Talk to me about Barrett. Numbers uh, were not as bad as a lot of people thought they might be. No, they certainly weren't. I mean, uh, we had uh, revenue up by about a percent, but to £5.3 billion. But pre trust profit was nearly up 10%, and uh, that was all pretty positive. Uh, the, the downside was that forward sales, so houses which are on Barrett's books, but uh, haven't been sold yet, uh, basically dropped to 49%. And last year, that same number was 68%. So we have a drop of about a third with regards to forward sales. And obviously, this has to do with the fact that the Bank of England has hiked rates and that the mortgages have become far more expensive and not that easily available to uh, first-time buyers, for example. Yes. Now, as I mentioned, there's a lot of news flow in the mid-caps this afternoon. Uh, Dark Trace was one that caught your eye. Yes, I mean, Dark Trace is, is basically um, a cybersecurity company, as we all know. And uh, here, the share price actually dropped by up to 9% intraday. And that was um, because its forward guidance with regards to earnings um, declined to about 17 to 19% for the next year, for 2024 um, earnings and uh, back in July we're saying it would have earnings of about 22 percent now the interesting thing is its uh, revenue was still up 31 percent its net profit was actually up four thousand percent but that was because last year it only had a profit of about one and a half million dollars but um, intraday a very uh, volatile stock which I think ended uh, the day slightly down yeah yeah as you say it's, uh, the numbers were, were pretty good it was the outlook statement wasn't it now another one that uh, caught your eye Ashmore group we probably don't talk about this one enough on the program well-known fund management company it certainly is and its uh, speciality is emerging markets and uh, obviously with the emerging markets uh, not performing that well over the last uh, year or so uh, its pre-tax profit dropped by 6%, but that's nothing compared to last year's drop. That was, I think, 58% because of the invasion of Ukraine. But since then, the um, uh, fund manager basically had difficulty in retaining its clients, and it lost about $11.5 billion in funds, and that's about 13% of its funds. And obviously, that has an impact, a negative impact, on its management fees and on its earnings. But its CEO was actually uh, st still quite upbeat and he basically says that uh, the emerging market cycle 
is out of the rut now. And that because of uh, inflation falling in a lot of country, countries over the globe and also growth uh, rising again, emerging markets should also uh, benefit in the future. And maybe then you will have a bigger inflow of funds again. Yeah, always a company worth listening to on emerging markets, Ashmore. Got to leave it there, Axel. Great to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. That's it from me. Well, I'm back again tomorrow for our morning programme at 11.30. Hope very much that you can join me for that. In the meantime, do stay tuned. We'll have Mark Austin up next with all the latest on that escaped prisoner. Don't go away. Cheerio.